Well, it's time that we talk about signs and seasons. You all know what the Mayan calendar says. But the real truth of the matter is they ran out of rock. <laughs> well, I got so much room on there. And then it starts over. But we do have some signs that are very important and we need to take a close look at them. But uh, you know me, I'm mostly scripture. And I always stick with that. But for your benefit, we have to pay attention to what's happening. I've had you watching Saturn for quite some time. We'll talk about that. But I want to remind you again of a very unusual thing that's about to happen on this winter solstice, on that same day, December the 21st. I'm going to read it to you again. I have before, but I don't want you to forget it. What about December the solstice? It is the moment when the Earth's North Pole is tilted most away from the sun, giving midwinter for all northern hemisphere, midsummer for the southern. The sun appears to travel along the eclipse, a great circle that has to cross every other great circle at two points. And one of these great circles is the galactic equator, or midline, or the Milky Way, right dead center, okay? In 2012, the instant the solstice is December the 21st, 11 hours and 12 minutes, universal time. That's 6, 12 Eastern, 5, 12 Central, 4, 12 Mountain, and 3, 12 Pacific. Isn't that something? Got it right there. Okay. But that's as she moves along. Okay. The solstice point, like all points on the ecliptic, moves slowly westward, rightward, that is to say, by about 170 seconds of a degree per year because of the precession. The claim is that 2012, it will be arrived at the exact point where the ecliptic crosses the galactic equator, this will last, have happened 25,800 years ago, the length of that cycle. That's a long, long time. And, and uh, the Milky Way, of course, being that pathway. That's important. That's, it's been a long time since that happened. Now, Saturn, of course, is... Um, what in your Bible, in Amos chapter 5, 26, Saturn is called Kayan. You might, C-H-I-U-N. Uh, That's the same as Cain, so to speak, Cain in the Hebrew tongue. That's Satan's planet. And it has been in the sign of Virgo for over three years. And because uh, this is from two separate universities, this is not off the internet with some stargazer looking out dreaming, okay? These are factual. Virgo is much longer than the average um, zodiacal constellation, and Saturn takes not two and a half, but more like three and a half years to cross it. Three and a half years, that's an interesting time, isn't it? Hmm. That is, it entered Virgo in late 209, performs here three um, opposition-centered times of best appearance, of which this is the third and will spend the fourth, 2013, oscillating across Virgo and Libra border. Now, now that, don't let that get away from you. Your companion Bible goes into detail on this, okay? Though I'm reading from two college professors. But uh, what exactly does that mean? Well, what does Virgo, Vir, the Virgo, of course, is the virgin. And within her is the Mac, the branch, which is Christ, of course. Now, uh, when, when we come to Libra, uh, Libra is a woman holding a set of balances, okay? It's called justice. Do you know who the woman is that holds the balances? It's Virgo, okay. So one of the main stars, and you with companion Bibles in your appendix 12, you will have the information I'm about to read to you. Um, you have uh, in Libra, 
the C-R-U-X, crux, which is Latin for cross. You have the cross there. And you, you might recognize that word as people saying, well, when you get right down to the crux of the matter, okay, that means where two points meet. Well, this is where it comes from. It's from Libra and the cross. But what, does, what is the name of this crux in the Hebrew tongue? It's karath. And karath in the Hebrew tongue means cut off. And when you look in your companion Bible in Appendix 12, it will say, as it is used in Daniel chapter 9, verse 26. That's important, Daniel 9, 26. When the cross, which this is, cut off Messiah. But in the next verse, it says in the middle of the week, the Antichrist comes and, and um, changes time and places, even our taking Holy Communion. Why, and what's it taken to himself? So it definitely has to do with um, the coming of the false Messiah, as it is written in Daniel 9.27. So those are the signs in the heaven. They're pretty, they're pretty interesting, my friends. Not everybody goes into that sort of thing, and you should always pay attention more to the scripture than you do signs in heaven. But the signs in heaven count, okay? Uh, it's because God himself would say in Genesis chapter one, I give you these for signs, seasons, and things that you're supposed to pay attention to. And of course, anytime, anytime Virgo, the virgin is mentioned, and of course, when the Satan planet has spent the last three and a half years, for your information as best I can determine, uh, the Saturn departs Virgo October the 29th of this year. Now it's 2012. But as you heard me read about that it peaks back again in 2013, do you know when that is? That's March. Do you know what happens in March, about the middle of March? Purim comes along. And here Saturn peeps back into Virgin, Virgo in right at the day of Purim, basically. That could, you know, I could, I could teach a sermon on that, but uh, I'm a scripture man, okay? And not um, gazing off into the distance too much, but yet at the same time paying attention to the heavens and what's happening. So uh, those are your signs for this season. And we're going to go now into God's scripture and see what the signs are there. We're in Amos chapter five, where Saturn is translated um, uh, Chiun, C-H-I-U-N. You, you wanna pay attention also to, to uh, the book of Acts in chapter seven, verse 43. Saturn is translated Rimphan, Rimphan an improper translation, but nevertheless, for your information, that's where you can follow up on Saturn to continue there. And now to the Word of God. Open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 11. Now, what trump are we in in Revelation 11? And I don't want you to do as some made a mistake last year when I was teaching chapter 10 and I said, certainly never forget, chapter 10 happens in the sixth trump. Many reported that I reported we were in the sixth trump. No, I said that chapter 10 was in the sixth month. Sixth trump, brother. We're not there yet, okay? If we were, Satan would already be here on earth. And many might think he is, he's not. But I want you to now take a look as we continue from chapter 10 into chapter 11 concerning the sixth trump. God always gives us a little more information if you'll look for it as to what you're supposed to be doing when the two witnesses are here. So let's get to it, okay? Chapter 11, the great book of Revelations, verse one. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod. And the angel stood saying, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. Now, I want you to learn something before we go any further. There are two words that are translated temple, 
from the manuscripts. One is Neos, and, and, the, and the other is Hiran. And it makes a big difference. Uh, Noos means the Holy of Holies and the altar. Not the walls, not the, not the wailing wall, and not the parameter. And, uh, and, but when you use the word Hiran, it means all of the temple area. So it becomes important to a student of God's word that you know the difference. Because what are we talking about? This rod is a rod of destruction, not to measure for building. And it's only going to destroy Neos. For you that might not understand what I'm talking about, it would be like you at home saying, this is my kitchen. This is where we fix grub. But then if I want to describe my home, I say, this is my home, okay? And it covers the whole house. Why is it just talking about Neos, the Holy of Holies here for destruction? Because of 2 Thessalonians chapter two, verse four, where it says, the Antichrist, the son of perdition stands in the holy place, Neos, claiming to be God. We're gonna destroy him. That's what it means. And not the whole temple, just where he is. Well, why not the whole temple? Well, listen, verse 2. But the court, which is without the temple, again, this is Naos, the court that's outside the Holy of Holies, leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles and to the holy city, and, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot 42 months. 42 moons is always Satan's uh, prophecy, okay? We're children of light. Any prophecy concerning us is days, days, uh, not moons or months. So there, you leave the rest of it out. Now, if any of you are familiar with the rock of the dome and the dome, this will begin to make sense to you about what's about to transpire, okay? Think about it. Verse three, and I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days. That's light. That's solar. That means children of God, clothed in sackcloth, uh, so they are. Verse four, these, who are they? These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. Well, let me see now, who actually stands or has stood before God? Well, if you go to first Kings, and if you were to go to the 17th chapter, if my memory doesn't fail me, and verse one, what do we have saying here? And Elijah, the Tishbit, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, as the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand. I want you to know who stands before God. Before whom I stand, they shall not be due nor reign these years, but according to my word. That was three and a half years. Same little trip in your time that Saturn was in Virgo and now heads for Libra where the balance is, is there. Get even time. Okay. Well, could then one of the two witnesses be Elijah? Well, tell me this. In, Revelation, in Matthew chapter 19, when Christ went to the Mount of Transfiguration, who appeared with him? Who was standing before the Lord? It was Moses and Elijah. Well, Moses, man, let me think of it. Look what he did in Egypt. Ooh, fire and blood. And I mean, he did some fantastic things. He was standing before God, face to face. God speaking to him, take off thy shoes. The ground on which thou stand is holy. He knew he was a servant of the living God and he happens to be one of the sons of oil spoken of in Zedekiah chapter four. We're moving into a time that it's going to take two people that have these powers that stand before God because at the same time they are performing miracles well, I would think that anybody would be convinced by what they're going to do here. What's happening in Jerusalem? 
Why did God say take that reed of destruction and destroy the holy place? Have you ever read Revelation chapter 13, verse 11? He's performing miracles that make some of these things look pretty small. He's performing bigger miracles than these. And who do you think is going to believe who? Unless you're mentally prepared beforehand where you have read God's word. You know the signs of the season. You see, know, and understand. And you're not going to be had by lies or deception or people leading you astray. You're going to stick to the word of God. That's the most important thing. That is if you're interested in living forever in the eternity. Or if you would rather take the shortcut, do you know where it goes? You do not want to go there. You would have to have a boxcar load of asbestos drawers to even make it through the gate hardly, okay? You don't want that. It's too loving and interesting to be with the Father and to be blessed. So what do these two do? Verse five, and if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. And of course, you know, in 2 Kings 1, 10, 8 through 10, um, they sent 50 men out to get Elijah. And they challenged him and Elijah said, let God bring fire down and destroy you. Boom, they were gone. So fire coming down and destroying people is not a new thing to Elijah. Is it to you? You know, I've had 1,250 or 800 people come by claiming to be the two witnesses. Okay. Let me see some fire, okay? <laughs> Let's do it. They're just a big dud, okay? We've already got our two witnesses, so don't ever listen to an uninformed person and be deceived. We're coming into a difficult time. If you think you've seen something yet, the locusts are swarming and have even moved into the devouring stage. And you're seeing it today. You're living it. And you'd better sharpen up and you'd better really be alert. Things are coming to pass rapidly. Verse, uh, there, there is only one, there's, there's, uh, I might throw this in for the student. There is only one of the wraths of God that didn't line up with the, the miracles that Moses could perform. And it's the fourth one, the fourth wrath. And that is the sun and fire from heaven just in case you might want to know where and what makes it any different because the wrath of God does not come until this sixth trump. And all seven of those wraths will be poured out during this period of time. Our father's on the throne. He means business. The woman with the scales, Lady Justice, three and a half years she's put up with Saturn. And she's now holding the balance or the judgment. Going to get a little rough on him, I'm predicting. Verse 6. These have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy and have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. That's the plagues of Moses' time in Egypt. And when they shall have finished their testimony, when it's over, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit, that's Lucifer, that's Satan himself, that's the son of perdition, shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. Do you want to know why God said get that reed for destruction? When Satan has direct orders in chapter 9 of this book, don't you touch mine elect that have the seal of God in their forehead. And when he messes around and kills the two witnesses, he blows the whole package. He's just about to get his beat time. And you're going to be part of it. Uh, verse 8, And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom, and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Well, now, a child can think about this a moment. Well, our Lord was crucified in Jerusalem. Why is it bringing Gomorrah and Egypt into this? 
Well, you know, I could, I could tell you, and, and I guess we've got a little time. Let's go to Second Peter. I'm going to. You don't have to. I'm going to try to. First Peter comes after James, and Second Peter always follows First Peter, right? Okay, and we want chapter 2, verse 6, if my memory doesn't fail me. 2 Peter, chapter 2, verse 6. And, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemn them with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that after such live ungodly same-sex marriages, and deliver just yacht vexed with the filthy conversation of the wickedness. They're so wicked. Military troops, um, gay as a gay lord. For that righteous man dwelleth among them in seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. Uh, the Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of the temptations and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished, and they shall be. That's why Sodom and Gomorrah was brought back in. Maybe you haven't heard of same-sex marriages lately. Okay? I think everybody has. That's why it's brought in. Okay? But what about Egypt? Why in the world? Well, one thing, Moses has performed these miracles in Egypt. But there's more to it than that. Why would it be connected with Gomorrah? Let, let me think a moment. Let's, let's see if we can put something together here in the great book of Exodus. What would it, Exodus took place from the coming out of Egypt. And I'm going to go to Exodus chapter 1, verse 16, if my memory doesn't fail me. The children of Israel were growing like 60. That's an old country saying that means they were really getting it on. Okay. Production. Well, maybe I better back off of that a little bit. <laughs> I mean, that, the, the uh, growth of families was increasing. Okay. Verse 16, what happened? Why would Egypt be brought into this? And, and this was the Pharaoh of Egypt. And then he said, when, do you do, when you do the office of midwife, that means delivering babies to the Hebrew women and see them upon the stools. If it be a son, then you shall kill him. Kill them babies. But if it be a daughter, then she shall live. And poor little old Moses, you know, you do know that the one that is gonna be one of the witnesses was fell under this category, was baby killing. That's why that his mother put him in a little basket and floated him down the Nile. And God delivered him, and he would lead Israel out of captivity. It won't be the first time he's done it. He'll do it again. So then you can begin to see why Gomorrah and Egypt are connected with Jerusalem today, where, which will be headquarters at that time with Satan officiating. It's all right. Just fall. listen to me, he will say, when you know better. Listen and learn from your father's word. A child knows where Christ was crucified. You know it was Jerusalem, not Sodom and Gomorrah, and not Egypt. But you can understand why God pulled those two in. You see, there are things that bring God down from heaven. Same-sex marriages and, and um, uh, destroying children will do it. We're just about at that point. Get ready for it. And we continue then. And when, when, they have show, when they should have finished their testimony, we got that verse 8, and their dead bodies shall lie in the street of that great city which spiritually is called Sodom in Egypt, which, where also our Father was crucified, and our Lord was crucified. We got that. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And so it is. But do you know that God gave us a psalm that covers this? That tells you what you're supposed to do. Do you know what that psalm is? It's 79. We're going to go there. 
Psalms 79. Psalm 79, I'll give you just a second. God never hides anything from us. He always, when you're anxious about something, gives you the working knowledge to be able to overcome and to be comforted, to be forewarned. Psalm 79, and I'm reading. O God, the heathen are come into thine inheritance. Thy holy temple have they defiled. They sit in the holy place. They have laid Jerusalem on heaps. This is why Christ would say when he left Jerusalem one day in Matthew 24, there won't be one stone left standing atop another when those balances tip. The dead bodies of thy servants have they given to be meat into the fowls of the heaven, the flesh of thy saints unto the beast of the earth. They murdered them, the two witnesses. Their blood have they shed like water round about Jerusalem. And there was none to bury them. Oh no, do you know why they won't bury them? It's real simple. They don't want somebody to say they were stolen away in the night. They're going to be laid out right in the wide open. That's where they make a big mistake too because Christ is going to resurrect them in three and a half days. We are become a reproach to our neighbors, a scorn and derision to them that are round about us. Does that bother you? Do you give two hoots what a neighbor that's going to hell thinks about you? I, you know, I, I mean, let's get, let's, get, let's get real here. When the world comes against us, we don't care. Why? Because God is with us. And we will make that stand. Because God loves us and we return that love in return. Po political correctness is a fine thing, only it's morally correct that counts. And you will do that that is moral. You will stand with your father. He stood with you on the cross. He did not back down. You can at least make that stand for him. How long, Lord? Wilt thou be angry forever? Shall thy jealousy burn like fire? And um, verse six, pour out thy wrath. We're talking about the seven vials here, friend, called the wrath of God. Upon the heathen that have not known thee and upon the kingdoms that have not called upon thy name. It's coming. The locusts can swarm. The locusts can devour. But the wrath of God will have the final say. And we're coming there. We're coming to that place. Verse 7. For they have devoured Jacob and laid waste his dwelling place. Oh, remember not against us former iniquities, our sins. Let thy tender mercy speedily prevent us, for we are brought very low. And if you were to look at the might of the world and the power that Satan is gradually taking in various nations and in political factions, then certainly you can see and understand that statement. Help us, O oh God, of our salvation for the glory of thy name. Deliver us and purge away our sins for thy name's sake. Wherefore should the heathen say, where is their God? We can throw his name out. It doesn't make any difference. Leave Jerusalem and God and everything else out. You know, just toss it in the street. Let him be known among the heathen in our sight by the revenging of the blood of the servants which he has shed. And boy, are the two witnesses, the vengeance is going to be super. Okay. What a time to live. Do you understand that you're living in that generation? You want to thank God that he picked this generation for you. Somebody that he can really count on. Somebody that's going to be a champion of the people that God can call on, that God can use. Let the sighing of the prisoner come before thee. According to the greatness of thy power, preserve thou those that are appointed to die. We'll have 10 days trial and some might be delivered up before death, which is none other than Satan. I don't mean a literal death, just his name. But you know something? I hope Satan doesn't frighten you. He's a dead man walking. 
and you're a child of God that has eternal life. And God has placed the power by using his name of even defeating Satan. You don't have anything to worry about. We have the victory. God blesses us. And render unto our neighbor sevenfold unto their bosom their reproach wherewith they have reproached thee, O Lord. Not us, but mock God. Get even with them, and he will. So we thy people and sheep of thy pasture will give thee thanks forever. We will show forth thy praise to all generations, especially this one. So there you have it, the two witnesses and the nations swarming. But God is on the throne. Do you know what caps this off? Would you believe there's another psalm that directly is affected in this? Well, there is. Do you want me to tell you what it is? Big old number nine, judgment, okay? Big old number nine psalm. Number nine psalm reads, I will praise thee, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will show forth all thy marvelous works. You got to repeat it. You got to plant those seeds. I will be glad and rejoice in thee, and I will sing praise to thy name, O thou most high. And he is. When mine enemies are turned back, they shall fall and perish at thy presence. He's coming. For thou hast maintained my right and my cause. Thou settest in the throne judging right. He always does. He's at the throne now, but you're here. And he can count on you. Thou hast rebuked the heathen. Thou hast destroyed the wicked. Thou hast put out their name forever and ever. They're not going to make it unless things change. O thou enemy, destructions are come to a perpetual end, and thou hast destroyed cities. Their memorial is perished with them. But the Lord shall endure forever. He has prepared his throne for judgment. That means it's coming down. The hammer is going to fall. And he shall judge the world in righteousness. You're going to get everything you got coming to you. He shall minister judgment to the people in uprighteousness. The Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble. That's Jacob's trouble. You want to know where to find solace? You want to know where to find protection? You don't get it from man. You get it from our Father. He's on that throne. He is the judge. And they that know thy name will put their trust in thee. For thou, Lord, hast not forsaken them that seek thee. He will not. You may have bad days. He may be just toughening you up. Because he knows you can cut it. I do too. Or you wouldn't be here. Sing praises to the Lord which dwelleth in Zion. Declare among the people his doings. When he maketh inquisition for blood... He remembereth them. He forgetteth not the cry of the humble. Don't you ever think that he forgets one of your prayers when you humbly seek him and serve him. He loves you and he hears that prayer. He knows that prayer. Have mercy upon me, O Lord. Consider my trouble, which I suffer of them that hate me. Thou that liftest me up from the gates of death. And, and that's the way it is. Okay. Satan is death. That's one of his names. Don't let it shake you. He's a dead man walking. That's why, he's called, that's why he is called death. That I may show forth all thy praise in the gates of the daughter of Zion. I will rejoice in thy salvation. 15. The heathen are sunk down in the pit that they made. In the net which they hid is their own foot taken. They can swarm. They can riot, but they're setting up their own trap, okay? They're going to be taken in it. It's going to happen. That's God's promise. The Lord is known by the judgment which he executeth. The wicked is, sneer, is snared in the work of his own hands. Higion, uh, Shelah. Do you know, don't, don't read over that. What, what does this Higion mean? You know what Shelah means? It means stop and you meditate. That means 
put this gray matter in gear, I want you to think about that. But the secret lies in hegion. It's an e it means that and somebody is also meditating, but it's an evil plot. They're plotting against you. But God's going to tell you what it is. Hegion. Sheila. That means calmly. Stop the music. Think. Think for yourself. There's an evil plot. How does it happen? He tells you, verse 17, the wicked shall be turned into hell. And all the nations that forget God. You think you got something to worry about? He's secretly letting you know there. Higion. For the needy shall not always be forgotten. The expectation of the poor shall not perish forever. Arise, O Lord. Let not man prevail. Let the heathen be judged in thy sight. And they shall be. Don't get nervous when you see a lot of uprising and everything. There's going to be something that's going to cool that down in a hurry. Put them in fear, O Lord, that the nations may know themselves to be but men. I, I want you to read all of Psalms 10. I'm going to only read a few verses of it with you. It still falls in the same line, okay, of what happens when the two witnesses prevail and that six trump sounds. You see, in the latter verses of that chapter 11, the seventh trump sounds. So you want to absorb it and you want to be ready. You want to know. And this is how the 79th Psalm and this one lets you know God's not going to forget about you. Even as the two witnesses are there, you're all right. He's not going to forget and he's already sent blessings. Why standest thou afar off, O Lord? Why hidest thou thyself in times of trouble? He doesn't. Okay. The wicked in his pride doth persecute the poor. Let them be taken in the devices that they have imagined. You're going to see a lot of this going on in the world. You go, as, as the sixth Trump said, you go to the Euphrates and you look east and you will see it. You can't look east from here and see it. You've got to go to the Euphrates, spiritually speaking, and look east from there and watch it. You see it every day on television. It's happening. Verse 3, for the wicked boasteth of his heart's desire and blesseth the covenant whom the Lord abhorreth, the, the covetous rather, those that like to take. The wicked through the pride of his countenance will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. Throw him out. Take him out of our platform. I wonder if that may sound something, I, you, know, you know what I'm talking about. They try to do away with the name of God every day, okay? His ways are always grievous. The judgment, thy judgment are far above out of his sight. As for all his enemies, he puffeth at them. They don't mean anything to our Father. If there was ever a time as the signs of this season are upon us, all you have to do is look up and watch them. They're happening. And they're happening before your very eyes. You can't help but turn on a television and the news reports these things coming to pass. You're in it. Even the prophets wanted to live in this generation. You're fortunate enough that you do. You're seeing it come to pass. How precious that is when you are affixed with truth so that you know how to act and interact with it. Does that mean that um, we are something special? No, we're really not. We're just children that love our Father. And He loves us. But he does send special people to us that do have the power and that do have the word. Just like he sent little Moses, a babe, a little baby, put him in a basket, shoved him out in the Nile, crocodile snapping, and 
his little old sister walking along in the reeds trying to keep up with the basket, trying to save the life of a baby from the womb. And that baby drifts right into Pharaoh's camp and controls it, takes it over. And not only did he take over that camp, but he came, became a leader of God's children. As you would read the last verse of the great book of Deuteronomy, it says there, there will never be another prophet like the prophet Moses. He had it and he stood firm when a lot of men would have fainted and fell and ran. He stood firm. So did Elijah. Elijah didn't run from anyone. We are very blessed that God chose you to give you the truth to know and understand what's about to fall upon us. And it is a pleasure indeed to be a part of you for we can get it done. Bring it on. We're ready. We're loaded. We're locked and we can handle it for a very special reason. He's with us. And if you read the back of the book there, we win. Okay. We win every time. So I'm going to leave you with that. Watch the signs of the time. You're living in a very special time. And you are very special people. Now, that, that, I don't want to have to take a pin and punch holes in you here or anything and air you back down. You're, we're just here to do God's work, okay? Very common people the, um, still eat pinto beans and potatoes, okay? And find them good, real good. But God can use people like that, you know? He always has people that can get it done. That's what I love about you all so much. Do you know something? <clears throat> you started out <clears throat> as such a small group. And now you are on more television than any other ministry in the country. You really are. <clears throat> and, and you have done that. You have God in touching you has done that. And the growth exploding. It truly is exploding. These are hard times, but God is blessing us clear out of our bonnet. Well, what does that mean? With people. People are hungry. People are thirsty. And if you feed them, they will come. Okay. Well, what do you feed them? The Word of God. The truth. And it will always prevail. Why? God truly indeed does love you. The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It's getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13 verse 8, many will be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. No shipping and handling. Just call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also mail your request to Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. It's a many, many, many membered body. It's not a building. It's people that have the truth. That's the temple. And what point will the Lord make the, the world new as it was before? Again, you need to read Revelation 21. It says there is a new earth. It's, the word in the Greek is rejuvenated. This same earth will all... God made an eternal covenant in Ezekiel chapter 16 with Yerushalayim. That's, that's where his home will be forever. And uh, right here on good old earth. Carol from Alabama. Will paradise be on earth during the millennium because heaven is wherever God is? And I thought only Jesus and his teachers and those who have not overcome would be on earth during the millennium and for and the full Godhead with the rest of the overcomers will be on 
<coughs> earth after the millennium was over for judgment in eternity. Well, you're, you're pretty well right. But Christ, when he is on earth, is God with us. <clears throat> and what does it mean that heaven is closed for that thousand year period? It's very simple. Because you either make the first resurrection, that is to say while you're in a flesh body, you gain the first resurrection and you are with the Father or the Son, it doesn't matter, whatever your duties are. But nobody can overcome and proceed to heaven and, uh, during the millennium if they fail the first resurrection until the second resurrection comes on as it's written in Revelation chapter 20 and if you don't make that one you're going into the lake of fire okay so that's why heaven is closed as far as overcoming is concerned until Satan is released a little short season why to see whether those that didn't make the first resurrection can cut it they're going to be tempted uh, probably even a little more because they're being spiritual bodies. But they should know better, just as you were in a spirit body if you're one of God's elect in the first earth age and had full recount, so will you in that age. I hope that didn't confuse, but be that as it may. Varen from California. When we die, will we still have all of our knowledge? You will most likely have a great deal more knowledge in these flesh bodies, we have about 10% of um, what we are capable of knowing and having, is my opinion. Uh, and in, in a spiritual body, we know everything. There's, you won't have to ask your neighbor, does he know the Lord? What will be taught then in the millennium if everybody knows everything? Discipline, that's what is lacking. <clears throat> Mike from Indiana and Marsha. If someone attacks your family and you defend your family and someone gets killed, would that be considered murder? Thank you and God bless you. You have been We've been studying with you for 14 years. Well, thank you. It's good to have you with us. Uh, when you say if someone attacks your family, that puts it in the mode of self-defense. And God approves of self-defense. If, some, if somebody is taken out uh, while, while they're trying to damage or harming your family, you're doing what God intended you to do is to protect your own. And so it, the answer is no, it would not be murder. Murder is the word, let's take it in the Greek, okay? We could take, we'll take it in the Hebrew, it's the same. But let's take it in the Greek because that's the word Christ said. He said, you have heard it is you would be in danger if you kill. Well, the word is not kill, it's murder. And it's fonyons in the Greek. And it means criminal homicide. So uh, if you commit a criminal homicide, when it comes to your main trial, which is in heaven, you're in a heap of hurt. But to protect your family is, is normal, should be. Sherry from Oklahoma, uh, where would you study in the Bible for the seven seals? Revelation chapter 6, okay? And, and uh, you will have the seals, all of them there, basically, and uh, it's good to know them. They're comforting and wonderful to, to study, especially the fifth seal at this time. The fifth seal tells you the false Christ is coming first and what you should do about it. We're in that sixth seal at this time. Carol from Alabama. Will God rejuvenate the earth after his final day of judgment, the great white throne of judgment? Yes, he will. That's, that's about the third time Revelation 21 has been brought up, uh, unbeknownst to them, in today's lecture. And again, I will emphasize, when you read the English translation, it states, you have a new earth, and that's incorrect. You have a rejuvenated earth. God puts this earth back in its original form. The firmament goes back where the firmament belongs, and um, everything is, is back as it was originally. There is a reason that we find mammoths with buttercups in their mouth and the tundra all the way up in Alaska. 
where buttercups don't grow there, and uh, but it, it's it's perfect there. Or as you've seen documentaries that we have made in in New Mexico, where you have palm trees petrified on hilltops in the desert. There are no palm trees growing in the desert now, but those petrified ones grew there before the earth, uh, the, the Cutabo uh, took place. It was perfect everywhere, is what I'm saying, in the original, the first earth age. Chase from North Carolina. I like all your TV, like all of your TV viewers, I appreciate your forward teaching style and have been a, an avid listener. Well, thank you, appreciate that. Please clarify my misunderstanding that an evil is caused by, all evil is caused by Satan and his minions, not by God. Uh, and you mention a certain pastor, I'm not going to say anything about that. That concept is clearly stated. I'm not sure what your comments would be. And, and you quote Isaiah 45, 7, I form the light, I create darkness, I make peace and create evil. Is uh, I, the Lord, do all these things. Do yourself a big favor and take that word evil. Go back into your Strong's Concordance and see what the Hebrew word actually is. It's not evil. It's tumult. If you deserve tumult, God will bring tumult upon you, okay? And and boy, would, can he do that big time. Um, you want to be real careful of allowing someone to say God brings evil or trouble. He said, I don't even want you to say I bring a burden. And you can read in Jeremiah chapter 23. If you wake up in the morning and say, I wonder what burden God's going to put on us today, you better saddle your mule and get ready to ride because you're going to get your donkey overloaded big time. God doesn't appreciate it. And he lets you know that if you, if you look up and accuse him of bringing burdens, he's going to burden you all right. It'll be probably the last time you'll ever do it. Uh, a wise person would never go there. God does not bring evil. God does not bring burdens. He do God does correct when one needs it. Marion from Washington, is it okay to sell my wedding ring to help a family member who is sick if my husband has passed away? Uh, you know, uh, hon, this is something totally you should decide for yourself. Uh, there, there would be no sin in it if that's what you're thinking. It would be perfectly all right, and it shows that you have a great deal of compassion, and if it would help somebody that was dire and sick, then uh, God bless you if you do that. But um, I, I cannot tell you, you have to make your own mind up on that because it was your wedding ring, but I can understand why you would not need it any longer because you're sealed there anyway. David from Florida. Thanks so much for your welcome. I don't know any church in my area that teaches the word. I do have a question. Why do you refer to Satan as being physically in heaven? I thought every entity in heaven is in the spirit. Please explain. Thanks and may God bless you all. You do, you do not understand that a spiritual, spiritual body has mass? It does. Uh, it's only in a different dimension. Flesh and blood cannot enter heaven. Why? Because it's a whole different dimension. Example, when Christ resurrected, he came through the door, but when he left, he did not go through the door. He went through the wall. So which was not there, Christ or the wall? Both were there, but he was in a different dimension. So... Um, Hopefully that will help you. Satan's evil spirit can traverse this earth now as God's Holy Spirit can. But his physical body will be cast out to this earth when he comes as the Antichrist. And it will be in a dimension that we can quite well see. Uh, Anna from, uh, from 
Uh, where is Anna from? Anna is from, my name is Anna, I'm, se I'm 78 years old. I was Christian born and I've been a believer all my life for 40 years. And whenever, when you are very young and you sin, not knowing any better, it is a forgivable sin. I don't want you to pressure my sister, all right? You th thank the Father for forgiveness and go in peace. Uh, Stanley from Alabama, question, why do the two witnesses have to die in the streets of Jerusalem? Um, been with you about three years, age 57. Well, it's good to have you with us. The two witnesses, uh, they've never died. Elijah, I know many say Moses died. God would not let man bury Moses, and even Satan in the book of Jude looks for the bones of Moses. He can't find them. Uh, so uh, I have to assume, in as much as Moses showed up on the Mount of Transfiguration, that they have to die once, okay, and they will in the streets of Jerusalem, but it's to document the true Christ's arrival, for they will resurrect at his appearance. And I am out of time. Hey, you know what? I love you all because you enjoy studying God's Word. That's good, but you know what's most important? God loves you for it. It's the letter he sent to you. And when you study the letter he sent to you, he makes your day because you make his day. It really makes him happy. Let him know you love him, won't you? We're brought to you by your tithes and offerings if we have helped you and only if we've helped you. You help us keep coming to you. Won't you do that? You bless God. He will always bless you. Most important, though, listen to me good. You stay in his word every day. And his word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus Yeshua is a living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.